Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Fantasies can help us escape. For John Graffair, a fantasy helped him carry on. Richard Jenkins received a Golden Globe nomination for his performance in The Shape of Water. He reads John's essay, In my fantasy, I caught up to reality. Lisa said it wasn't me. She said I was the love of her life. But something needed to change, she explained. And I was in the way. So she took our six-year-old adopted daughter and went to Florida, vowing not to return. Maybe I should have seen it coming. I knew how she struggled through New Hampshire winters, the long nights, the cold. I knew the loss of identity she suffered by not having a job she liked. I knew the ways she relied on me that I often couldn't be relied upon. But it was June. Winter was over. Summer was beginning. We had gotten through. We were dealing. Or so I thought. We'd been living together for more than ten years, but we were not married. She had adopted our daughter as a single mother, so I was a father with no parental rights. My relationship with Lisa, as well as my role as a father, existed in every aspect of our lives, except on paper. The only legal bond between Lisa and me was a house and the mortgage that went with it. But legal bonds wouldn't have changed the emotional facts. So it was that on a rainy, cold, wintry day in June, our world snapped. We woke up that morning together. By evening, they were gone. I was alone. Grasping for something solid amid the debris, I began going to the gym. At first, it wasn't really about exercise. It was about staying ahead of the emptiness. A workout was something I could control. And I needed to feel that I could still control something. A routine took shape. Two, three, four times a week, I'd go to the gym after work. I liked how every measurement of the workout was monitored. Distance run, stairs climbed, calories burned, levels of difficulty surpassed. Minutes of emptiness, blame, and sadness subdued. My heart may have been wounded, but I took comfort in how hard I could make it pump. My family was gone. Running wouldn't bring them back. Still, if I could catch up, run along beside them for a moment, close my eyes and hope maybe I would find myself in a place where perhaps there would be another chance. I was chasing hope, but hope was running faster than I could go. What I really had was an hour of time not to have to face the empty beds, the empty house, the empty child's car seat. It was a few weeks into the routine that I began to notice her. At first, she was just one of the stops my eyes made as they roamed around the room while I ran, like the clock, the calorie counter, the aerobics class on the gym floor. She was part of the scenery, except she was running just like me. There was a simple perfection to her body, healthy without being overdone. 
effortlessly flaunting itself as she ran. It was the kind of body people go to the gym for. There was also an unusual intensity to her workout. It seemed to be about more than good health and a perfect body. She ran as if chasing something off to avoid being consumed by it. So, we began dating. Nothing formal. In fact, I don't even think she knew about it. We would meet several evenings a week for a workout. We had matching schedules. Or perhaps it was uh, more of a matching lack of commitments. We both appeared to be unattached, with lives empty enough to allow for this regular free time after work. Nothing to rush home for. It seemed a good base for a beginning. She became the standard against which I measured myself. Who ran faster? Who ran longer? Who would be the first to slow? She always won, but that was all right. My challenge was to get a little closer with each try. It was a way of adding distance to my run, stamina to my workout. A dream for the rare nights I was able to sleep. Men often approached her. Their conversations were out of range. But body language can speak volumes. Her pace would never slow. Her focus never shift. The exchanges were brief, never initiated by her. She was not there to find a relationship or friends. There was something else. It was the mystery of that something else that nurtured my attraction. Was there a husband, a boyfriend, ex-husband, ex-boyfriend, girlfriend? Was it work? What kind of work? A lawyer, doctor, commodities trader, therapist? Maybe it was health. Maybe a doctor said, do this or die. Or maybe she wasn't running from or to anything. Maybe she just liked to run. Whatever the case, a plan for a more formal relationship took shape in my mind. It was patterned on the Bo Peep theory. Leave her alone and she will come. All it would take was patience. Patience may have been failing to bring Lisa and our daughter home from Florida, but as one hope receded, perhaps another could advance. That anything could develop between the woman at the gym and me was absurd, and I knew it. She was the alpha woman of the exercise room, drawing the interest of nearly every man in there. And then there was me. Not alpha in any sense, and although not old enough to be her father, I was old enough to be old, and she was young enough to be young. But I wasn't really looking. I was mourning. And one more hopeless situation didn't feel like an added burden. I was going to the gym anyway. I could control where my feet ran, but not where my mind wandered. Indulging the fantasy became my little secret. Over time, my weight dropped, my heart rate improved, my stamina increased, anger turned to regret, summer to autumn, and any hope that Lisa would return became buried in the backyard with each falling leaf. Our daughter's birthday was approaching. Lisa asked if I would come down to spend it with the little girl who missed her dad. And every part of me said no. It was everything I didn't want in my relationship with her. Hotel rooms and restaurants. But no home and no family. Just a single father and a daughter he no longer saw every day, trying to forge a new life from pieces. But I couldn't say no. I love her. The weekend after her birthday, I made the trip. We went to the zoo in the water park, the aquarium. We laughed, sang, read stories, swam in the hotel pool. We had fleeting moments of our old life. On the third day, 
I drove her back to her new life, not knowing when I would see her again. Crossing the bridge spanning Tampa Bay, she fell asleep in her car seat. I put my hand on her arm and cried quietly as I drove. We found the beach where we were supposed to meet her mother for the exchange. I wanted to drop and run. No long goodbye. Just end it quickly and go. Lisa wanted to talk. She said, I want to come home. I was surprised. And then I felt surprisingly reluctant, hesitant. Perhaps I was happier in my loneliness than I realized. Perhaps I was afraid. Perhaps all the little quirks that I didn't like about her had finally come to outweigh all that I loved. Sensing hesitation, she asked, Is there someone else? I thought of my courtship at the gym. Did that count? Does fantasy carry weight in real life? No. There wasn't anybody else. Four months apart had not diminished my love for either of them. I missed Lisa, our daughter, our family, our past, our future. If she was feeling the same, if she was ready to try again, to give me and us another chance, then the answer was clear. I flew back to New Hampshire the next day as scheduled. Soon a plan was made. I would fly to Florida in two weeks, and we would all drive home together. I began to prepare the house for their return, and I felt lighter in my step. I ran faster at the gym. I couldn't wait. The exercise routine that had come to be part of my life was also going to change. I would have a family to come home to again. I would miss my dates at the gym and the woman who, however obliviously, had kept me going for so many months. Two days before I was to fly to Florida, I went to the gym for the last time. She was there too. Our relationship was nearing an end, but only I knew it. I imagined she was watching me, charting my next move. At the end of two and a half miles, I stepped off the treadmill. As I walked across the gym floor, she stopped her run and also headed toward the locker room. We reached the entrances together, looked at each other, and said, Hello. It was the first time we'd ever exchanged words. She went into her locker room, I into mine. I collected my street clothes and jacket and headed out. And there she was again. This time we started talking. We introduced ourselves, shook hands, looked into each other's eyes. We talked as we walked to the parking lot, taking each other's measure. And then we said goodbye. I didn't tell her about my family coming home. I didn't tell her my evenings at the gym were about to change. I didn't ask her out for dinner. I didn't find out what made her run. I didn't wonder if it was too late to tell Lisa to stay in Florida. The fantasy of escape is a powerful thing, of starting fresh in a new place or with a new person. Yet, if Lisa could return to the difficult thing, to the real thing, then so could I. There were no second thoughts two days later as I boarded the plane to Florida. A few minutes before midnight, in the terminal of the Tampa airport, 
we put our arms around one another and became a family again. Richard Jenkins, reading John Grofer's essay, In My Fantasy, I Caught Up to Reality. Did John's relationship survive the separation? We'll check in with him after the break. John clearly remembers the day Lisa said she was leaving for Florida. Seasonal affective disorder had pushed her to a breaking point. I can tell you the day. It was a Thursday morning, and we were in the counselor, and Lisa said, I can't stay anymore. I have to leave. And it was just a total shock to me. And I remember the counselor sitting there saying, well, that's a new piece of information. And I thought, you jerk. (laughs) That's a new piece of information. That night... Lisa and their daughter Brinkley were gone. I remember thinking that she wouldn't leave and coming home and calling first and nobody answered the phone, and then going home and uh, finding the house empty and not knowing where she or, or Brinkley were. And uh, I know I didn't sleep. John did get to see Brinkley several times during the separation. He remembers telling her on one visit that maybe things would work out. And I remember her sitting in the back seat saying, no, Dad, I don't think that's going to happen. My five-year-old kid, no, Dad, that's not going to happen. Get over it. I don't think I ever completely gave up hope, but it was, at some point, you have to move on. And it's not so much giving up hope as making the decision, okay, this road isn't taking anywhere, you got to make an exit. But Lisa did decide to come back. The whole family drove from Florida to New Hampshire together, and they walked into a house that friends had decorated for their return. I used to go out and fill the house with flowers on the day we are going to come home. So the house was full of flowers, and then the neighbors got into it, and there were signs that said, welcome home, and, and yeah, the whole neighborhood got together. But the, the house was full of welcome for us all, and it was really for all of us. It wasn't just for them. It was for me, too. After Lisa and Brinkley came home, John still went to the gym, but his fantasy about the woman was over. When we got back together as a family, the hours changed of when I would do that and the frequency with which I would do that. So I would not see her that often. I do remember seeing her a couple of times on the street, but it was just kind of like walking into a store, out of a store, and I think we said hi and kept on going. Yeah, but that was it. Lisa and John still are not married. John says that they don't feel the need to codify the love they have for each other. Their daughter Brinkley is a freshman at Harvard now. And John says the time that they were separated has never shadowed his relationship with Lisa. It's not something that's back there that we dwell upon. It's just, it's out there. We know it happened. And we know we move beyond. And we've had moments where it almost happened again. But we have most of the time where we live in harmony, should I say. But clearly the biggest factor in us staying together was our daughter, you know, that we recognized that this was the right thing for Brinkley. And it certainly was. She's flourished and is a remarkable young lady. And I've always felt that both for Lisa and myself, our daughter never questioned our love. John Graffair. He's a documentary filmmaker living in Concord, New Hampshire. After the break, Richard Jenkins on what drew him to John's piece and Modern Love editor Daniel Jones. Dan Jones says he was struck by the way John responded to Lisa's decision to leave. It wasn't really a passivity. It was just an acceptance of you can't, you can't get people to do what you want them to do in love. It's not, you know, that you don't care that you're not fighting. It's that you don't see fighting 
as being productive and and trying to convince someone to stay when when she clearly doesn't want to. It was really a moving story about a man who isn't aggressive, essentially, about his love life fantasy or his love life reality and how that approach makes it work out for him in the end anyway. We asked Richard Jenkins why he chose to read this essay. It really got inside the author's brain. And we all understand how important fantasy is in our lives to keep us sane. And um, fantasy, in this case, led to a beautiful outcome. Richard Jenkins. You can see him now in Guillermo del Toro's film, The Shape of Water. Next week, Andrea Martin from the NBC show Great News. She reads an essay about a woman's relationship with her doctor. But I also knew that if I was still alive, it was because of him. His bravery mattered when mine faltered. His mantra, you are fine, you are fine, cut through my doubt when it seemed there was no light. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, Amory Sievertson, and Caitlin O'Keefe. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. We'll see you next week. (laughs) 